Bonds traders are often considered pretty smart. So what happens when their number one indicator for calling a recession starts to flash red? Also, what's going on with AI? Broadcom has a pretty good result, yet still tanks in after hours trades. We know that there's a lot focused on the new non-farm payrolls number, and everything seems to be moving towards gap fills right into this particular result. So as the Fed is watching to figure out whether they need to do a 25 or 50 basis point cut, we need to be paying attention to all of the asset classes around the world. And in today's video, we'll talk about how there's so many different opportunities out there right now. Let's get into it. We're covering stocks, commodities, and cryptos together. Well, welcome back, everyone, to The Daily Show. It's great to have you here. And if it's your first time here, remember to subscribe and smash that like button. Every day we go through the markets and, of course, we cover the macro, the data, and the flows so that we all better understand what's going on in the markets. And boy, oh boy, have there been some big flows that have occurred over the last 24 hours. Let's talk yield curves, though, because, of course, the bonds market is what we're always looking at to give us a bit of a warning sign that we need to be concerned. And we've been talking here on the channel for the last six months about late cycle investing, generally the last one to two years of a market and how it tends to interact. Things like gold, things like utilities and other market sectors start to do better. Well, 2024 is facing that exact same kind of thing. And we know that when the uninversion of a yield curve occurs, generally a recession is just around the corner. So how long does it generally take? Well, firstly, let's consider one of the biggest signs here, 783 days since we actually inverted. Yes, this is now, I believe, the longest on track record, and it means that we need to pay a lot of attention to how long after we might be seeing a recession. Now, we notice on this chart that it does take time. It's not usually instantaneous and just happens straight away. And a lot of people are going to be freaked out in the markets, especially considering we're pulling back here in September and we're seeing this uninversion of the yield curve. People will think that we're going to crash straight away. Well, the data suggests that's not how it plays out. And if we omit these two that we were already in a recession during that time, and yes, I know a few of you in the comments may say that we're already in a recession, let's consider that it could be around 165 days on average. Now, this is the baseline. And this is basically saying that we have to expect that it could be still six months or even upwards of 12 months still away from actually crashing the market. So while the uninversion of the yield curve is incredibly important, it really comes back to understanding, do we see enough signs yet for the hard landing? Now, I believe, and many of you out there believe, that the Federal Reserve will not create a soft landing. And in fact, there's a chart that we shared in our previous video, and we'll do it again today, showing you that we're following a very similar potential inflation curve to the 1970s. So let's just talk about this for a moment. If we have a look here at Campbell Harvey's particular soft landing versus hard landing narrative, you'll notice that at the moment we have pretty strong housing equity debt. It's getting worse, of course, which we'll talk about in a moment. Unemployment is rising. Rates are still low. In terms of overall, of course, this could change with the non-farm payrolls numbers coming through. And do remember, of course, we had that 800K revision downwards overall in terms of the jobs. Real-time inflation is less than 2%. And yield curve inversion, of course, gave companies time to strengthen their balance sheets. So in general, people are saying, well, people can be prepared for this potential recession coming. On the hard landing side, of course, we've got debt. We've got other issues. We've got yield curve inversions, SARM rules, consumers' savings getting depleted, all of these big problems that we know are there. But multiple times we always say, let the markets decide, let the markets give us indications of weakness. We have several different ones. In fact, I have about seven different reads that I use. And I can tell you that at the moment, I'm not seeing those signs coming through. If I did, then of course we'd talk about it. We are seeing signs of late cycle, but we're not seeing signs of significant weakness in the market underlying structures. This has many banks such as this one here with Goldman Sachs saying, you know what, we think that the market has got a 20% chance of going into a recession over the next 12 months. Now, if this is true, then of course the markets will generally drive higher because the markets love climbing the wall of worry. And we've seen that several times over. We also know that the markets are starting to price in a 38% chance of recession, which means that it's becoming that most discussed topic again. When everyone thinks a recession's coming, generally it won't. And you actually kind of want that number to go up and up and up. In fact, if it goes to like 50% chance of recession or something like that, it probably won't be coming just yet. 
Let's consider this reinflation story, though, because, of course, the Federal Reserve and everybody else have told us we've beaten inflation. Don't worry, guys. It's all good. Well, did you know that we're following at this stage anyway the exact same path as we did in the 1970s? And of course, by injecting liquidity like the Federal Reserve is going to be doing now and cutting rates, there is a good chance that we could spike the underlying inflation again. I believe this will be the story of the next 12 months, and there is a real chance that we might start to see this play through. One of the things in particular we'll be looking for is iron ore and certain commodities markets to start to show turns in terms of CTA flows and, of course, price action. And we'll go through that together. But I thought there were a couple of interesting reports I've seen recently. This one here is from 314 Research, and it comes in with some data around property. And property is an important factor, even if you're a stock trader, bonds trader, commodities trader, doesn't really matter. You can see here that multifamily and single family units under construction are now falling simultaneously for the first time since 2020. And of course, if we don't see an uptick in the housing activity, construction job losses are coming. Now, of course, what's this going to do? Jobs are going to be lost. It's a huge sector. And we're going to start seeing weakness in things like XHB, which has been very strong. At the same time as this, we're seeing quite a few 2% days starting to appear. Now, you've noticed we've started to track those. We're tracking along with many other members of the community and members of the greater investment community. So it is important to track the number of 2% flip days that we end up seeing. We're now getting three of those since July. And this means that we need to be paying attention to whether we're in a super bubble, which arguably we are, and whether we need to be terrified or scared or more defensive. This is a bit of a blurry screen, so I apologize. You're not blind. Don't worry, guys. But it says here, share of global market capitalization. Now, we all know the US market is the best in the world, but it's taken 64% of the total cap in terms of overall size. So in many ways, it is really heavily priced. And you'll notice that JP Morgan's latest stats actually show that. Here's where the interesting factor goes. Are we actually leading into a market structural change? Now, you will have seen this chart a few times. Most election years go down the line of kind of showing a bit of weakness. And you can see here that it's a pretty interesting factor. We get a lot of weakness through there. But if we look at the average S&P 500 path in election years that did not end in a recession, this actually changes the stats quite a lot. And this is why it's important to take out some of those kind of underlying factors. You'll notice that actually the markets can grind higher during this time. Volatility might be high, but markets could grind higher. And this will be important because we know the next one to three months, especially after the Federal Reserve does a rate cut and we may get uninversion of yield, markets are going to make a structural decision. Will they choose to go with the no recession path, which seems the most likely at this point over the next 12 months, or will they choose to see something that we don't maybe necessarily see with our lead indicators just yet that are basically saying, you know what, a recession is coming. And that's more likely looking like this kind of orange path here. Well, we know a flash crash coming in is pretty symptomatic, more of a non-recessionary path. And we know that weakness after the cut is actually quite normal. That's the back end of September this year. So there's a lot going on this charts. And I think the next two to three months will be realistically incredibly important. Also, do remember if the Federal Reserve cuts 50 basis points, that shows more of a panic than if they cut just 25 basis points. This will be important. Global liquidity is also upticking. There is a quote over on our X account that talks about the idea, guys, of how central bankers and governments do not want weak markets to, of course, go down. So they do everything they can to stimulate them. And we're going into usually what you would consider a period of global liquidity stimulation. Effectively, really sluggish growth, if barely any growth at all, where the governments and banks and everybody around the world will do everything they can to try to keep this market up. And it's in our estimation, we will be doing an estimation kind of report here on 2025 in the future, that there could still be 15% in these markets in terms of the S&P 500 before it even hits what we would call the average baseline of a bull market cycle. And you might think that's insane, but it's kind of actually statistically factual here. Bad first day of the month. We saw Tuesday this week, horrible day. Obviously, big sell-off. DOJ report came out. Supposedly, NVIDIA was getting subpoenaed. Now it's not. Markets have still stayed down because, of course, they're using the catalyst of non-farm payrolls, most likely, to make the next big move. 
But we do know that the stats for these types of sessions do end up usually more bullish. We also know that when we have the markets going down, and then they stabilize while the volatility spikes the way it did, particularly on Wednesday, that in one month structures, I believe the market had never been lower. So basically the way we saw the VIX structure on Wednesday, the markets are usually never lower over the next one month. That's another fairly bullish stat there. Just a reminder, we also post our charts over on X, links in the description down below if you're interested, and we're getting very close to that gap fill zone that we've been talking about all week. Let's go over to ratios. Is this market expensive? Yes. Is this market long-term cheap? No. Can we see why Warren Buffett is selling it? Absolutely. He's got a big time horizon, obviously not himself, but in terms of his fund. And yeah, you don't really want to own a market generally like this if you have a 10, 15, 20 year time horizon, because we know that the underperformance rate is quite high. Speaking of non-fund payrolls, Goldman Sachs believes we're going to get 155K. A lot of people always ask on this channel and they ask in general, well, if the jobs number is good, will it go up? If the jobs number is bad, will it go down? Well, look, remember, these non-fund payrolls are generally completely wrong. The revisionist uh, points here of the last two will probably be revised down. We know the numbers are completely ridiculous. They always have been. Ever since I've been in this particular trading career, you know, since 2006, six seven, I can't remember a time when non-farms even looked correct. But what it does do is it does create opportunity because it creates liquidity for traders to potentially take advantage of. And of course, stop losses generally get hunted during not non-farm payrolls kind of results. If you think about August, August actually does have a history of being a little bit crappier, as you can see here on this chart. So that's something to be considered, although I don't think that's that predictive of particularly a, poten a potential move either way. We'll look at the structure in a moment. I just wanted to bring this chart in because, of course, you may know that I like utilities. And you might think, why do you like utilities? like the stupidest sector ever. In late cycle, it tends to do well. And, of course, it is also a pretty good proxy for doing all right off the old AI side. I've talked about this quite a few times. We've discussed it together. And that is that cryptocurrencies and, of course, data centers are using ridiculous amounts of energy. And that's, of course, helping many of these utilities companies to make some nice profits. NASDAQ 100 models, S&P 100 models, or S&P 500 models, they all kind of go down the line of CTAs being underinvested. So do remember Goldman Sachs believes that dips will be bought at this point by them. And bull market behavior checklists, yes, we still are theoretically in a structural bull market. You can also see here the Optima result, and this is just pure data, pulling out of January to September in terms of overall having a pretty good structure like we had here. The probability of gains moving forward is actually very strong, 91.67%. Let's now talk about some dark pull activity, then we'll get into some flows and of course S&P 500 charts. First up, let's have a look here at Tesla. We spoke about the positive gamma effect. Huge trade came through a two times ETF the other day and the rest is history. We actually managed to hit our first take profit target in only like what an hour of trade of the market on Thursday. That was fantastic. Congrats to anyone that actually did take advantage of the positive gamma side. That was pretty much a pure options flow move slash, of course, we saw some big trades come in. Speaking of other big trades, we have seen a few people starting to buy, or well, we have to assume it's a buy at this stage, some S&P 500. Now, of course, the market's dropping after hours, and we expect that. We expect the market to at least get towards the gap would be ideal. But if it reclaims this structural zone, that could be a great bull sign for markets. So we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's have a look at the last 24 hours. Gold did really well. Gold stock's fantastic. We've got communications and semiconductors starting to stabilize. And it was kind of like a little bit of a risk-off session overall. When we look at the last five days, utilities is number one, staples is number two, and randomly consumer discretionary is in the middle. That's pretty weird. It's certainly a weird combo. There's no, I think major factor that we can see here. But for one thing's for sure, we're not seeing significant weakness in financials, which I think is important to factor in. Let's have a look at the S&P. You can see here double rejection off these highs, sitting at 55.50. I think it's a classic day of pretty much options doing their thing. You can see we closed at 5,500. Well, guess what? That's exactly where we had the put wall of the last 24 hours. Let's take a look now at the futures because the futures is falling but this made perfect sense to our strategy this week, which was 5,500, we'd sit there, and then maybe we'll get down to 54, 60, 54, 
55. And you'll notice that's where that gap fill is. We've got an anchored VWAP. We've got options level low today. Remember, that's where the market believes 68% of the time the market will hold within those ranges. And we have quite a large structural trade range. So we're coming into the zone. We're falling into it one, two, three, four days so far in terms of overall sell. And I just want to kind of just talk here options because look at this. We actually have a 54, 50, 54, 60 strike, big amount of puts. Obviously, we're in negative gamma at this point. So it could create a cascade effect if they choose to do so. But this will be, I believe, where the bigger buyers try to get back in. You also notice, if we just zoom in here for a second, the structure on next week, Monday's trade, is 5,555.10. Now, that's higher than the current price. So what that's saying is if we do fall down, maybe the market will want to try to push back up above that price. It's kind of showing you a curve here that would make sense to the bull dip buyer. Does that mean it's going to happen? Nothing's guaranteed, guys. Do not ever go out there and think, well, I know exactly what's going on. Remember, trading is about getting your reps in. Always have to get at least 40 replications of the same trade to know your stats. And usually you'll be somewhere between that kind of 55 to I, I, I would say ideally 70, 75% in terms of your strike rate on your system. If you've got a 95 strike rate on your system, message me and uh, I'll have a chat to you. But generally speaking, you won't be doing good risk reward at that point. Let's move over to NVIDIA. NVIDIA here is uh, straight into, of course, negative gamma. We're moving around that 100 to 105. We know this is a very strong bullish buy structure. We also know that 120 next week, 119 is where all the calls are. And we kind of have to assume that the markets will try to hold around this 100 to 105 level on NVIDIA. Meanwhile, Tesla has the randomest overall flow compared to the rest of the market. This thing's fully engaged in positive gamma. We talked about it, how it looked totally different to any of the other stocks. And guess what? It's been kicking ass, actually. It's been doing really well. 2.30, big strike call rate. I would say it's going to be hard pressed to try to get through there by too much. But we do know that that would have positive gamma flow. And we also know that now everyone's striking off 240 for next week. So basically, yeah, we're fully engaged in positive gamma at this stage, but we did hit that major first TP. So we'll look at the rest of it in a moment. Let's move over to yield uninversion. You can see here we uninverted again. I think it's just a matter of time till we actually hold underneath this inversion curve. And yeah, that is an important factor. This is a big deal. It does put us on a timer and I don't think the indicator is wrong. I just think that we need to be looking specifically at the underlying as well. This is a warning sign. This shows you, you are fully in late cycle. And of course we have other indicators such as XLY, XLP, which we've had in our other videos, check out one of our other ones. And you'll notice that again, it's all playing out the way that you would expect. And a lot of people say late cycle got to crash tomorrow. That's not how it works, guys. It is a slow burn. Remember, the central bankers and the governments are doing all they can to try to support a lagging, slowing economy around the world. And that's what they're trying to do. Let's move over to the US dollar. It's already shown some signs of weakness. There could be some okay trading. Of course, at the moment, everyone's trying to scalp short it down. I totally understand why. Uh, you're going to have some issues or some things if the market does pull back up to like a 10140 to 10160 area. That's where you know you would probably see a bear if they're going to press it down. And if you have been in shorts on the dollar longs on the pound or the euro, well done. It's actually not a bad trade. Very replicable there, at least with the partial scale in. A lot of people asking about oil. Time to buy? I, I don't know about that. I, I think that oil is at a critical point, but this looks like a horrible market. The trend is down. There is There are really very few bid prices. You can see here it crushed that daily. We'll wait to after non-farms to look at oil more closely. Let's move over now to what's going on with copper. Copper, of course, strengthening up here a little bit. Really nice trade. It's actually one of the ones we had in our private community in terms of structural trade. I thought it was pretty strong when we were doing the analysis over the last 24 hours. Yeah, it did have a day trade on it. And potentially, it's actually moving to break now, 4.25. I quite like how it closed. Non-farms obviously could stuff the trade overall. But in general, I would say the market's actually looking a lot better on copper than it did just a few days ago. Also, gold's looking a lot better. Obviously needs to clear 25, kind of 30 to really get that significant breakout. We've had what we call a pullback in time. We've got a tweezer trade. We broke above 25.07. We started to rally. Same thing with silver. Very strong move there from silver. 
Nice little pullback as well. You might think, why would you want this pullback? I actually wouldn't mind silver and gold to drop a little bit. Silver in particular, if we could get into this demand zone, 2820, that could be where a big buyer comes back into silver. So again, one to watch over the next 24 hours. Let's move over to stocks. Tesla, wow. <laughs> Did anyone get 232? Fantastic. Big hit on that. Now you will notice it looks like an inverse head and shoulders, left shoulder, head, right shoulder, big neckline here. Weekly close will be all important. I would say it's at res at this point in positive gamma. A lot of people are going to be looking for a 246 gap fill. I wouldn't blame them. I think there could be even more on this if the market does end up breaching up. But of course, that is an absolute options flow at this point. Speaking of key levels and options flow, we know we've got some demand potential put walls behind in NVIDIA. It actually looks pretty bad in the charts. We clear 114 and close. That will be a significant buy, I think, on NVIDIA. But for now, it's kind of like it's at a key level. Some people are trying to buy this dip. I don't blame them. There's a pretty good level here, but we don't see strong bid just yet. Look at semiconductors as well. Two rejection wicks. Now, again, I've got here marked out 228. That'll be a key zone for semis. We clear above that. It's kind of showing that this downtrend, because remember, these are in downtrends at the moment. There's no real bid here is over. Now, let's have a look at some of the major indices. First up, HSI. It's doing nothing. It's sitting around just kind of consolidating. Again, if it gaps up, that'd be a beautiful island reversal for day traders. Could be something to watch. RSP back to the daily 20. Overall at role reversal ahead of major news. That is to be expected. US 2K, no bid. I did like the idea of 2150. There was no bid there. So we have to now move towards a 2080 kind of concept, 2075. So that could mean that the markets are going to drop a little bit further. Remember, we think that the S&P could drop at least about 30 to 50 points here. Could the Qs also do the same thing? This looks just like a semi-chart. And uh, at the moment, it looks horrible. If the market makes a new low, it could fill to the second gap. Now, of course, there may be buyers around here to the 61.8 fib. If the markets do choose to go bullish, we're looking for a clear of 4.65. We get that. It shows signs of significant change of trend, significant rally coming through. And for crypto traders, you really need a rally. There is nothing good on this chart right now. Of course, yes, I'm multi, multi, multi month into 12 month bullish on Bitcoin. It's a bit different to seeing momentum. There is no momentum here. And we know September is the worst month for Bitcoins. Historically, the worst month for Bitcoin, worst month for often stocks. And October, guess what, is the best month. So we are getting close. And uh, I am watching, I'm watching like a hawk with all of you, I'm sure, to you know, kind of find some momentum coming through here in the crypto markets. We've got here 60,000 and 61.5, or 61.15, but nothing quite yet on Bitcoin markets. In terms of news, we know that the biggest key here is going to be non-farm payrolls. Continue to watch for that number. How it comes out, generally non-farms goes off in one direction, then goes the opposite way sometime around half an hour to an hour afterwards. That's grabbing liquidity. So remember, that is a real possibility. If you enjoyed today's video and you want to find out more about what we do, check it out. Links in the description down below, guys. Make sure to follow us also on X to get all the latest updates. And of course, if you're interested in finding out more about replication and the way we do things, check out our seven-day flash sale. Bye for now. Catch you in the next one.